Good morning, good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, welcome back to another uh, lecture. Today's class, uh, we're going to be talking about the origins of the Great War and where this is all going to come from. So when we talk about World War I, um, at the time it was called the Great War, we're talking about the largest war that mankind had ever seen up to this point, from 1914 to 1918. You have 70 million people are going to fight in it, about 9 to 10 million are going to be killed in it, and about 25 million people are going to be wounded by it in some way, shape, or form. It is also a total war. And while civilian casualty numbers are hard to come by, we have at least 6 to 7 million civilians that are going to be killed in this. It is the first war that is fully industrial, that mobilizes and organizes the entire society in order to fight it. Um, it's also going to be the first war, um, modern war, in which civilians are directly going to be targeted. And so the Great War, more than any other event, is going to shape the world in which we live in, shape the 1900s, what we call the 20th century. And so the impact of this war is massive. Uh, firstly, it's a direct cause of World War II. Um, in Germany, the Nazis, including Adolf Hitler, uh, on the left of this picture, are World War I veterans who reject the end of the war and want to return Germany back to her former glory. Um, it destroys historical empires that had encompassed like a large part of the world's population. Um, the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East completely collapses. So does the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Um, and there are world revolutions that come out of this. There's an Arab revolt in the Middle East, which is kind of the root of a lot of conflicts that we're going to have today. In Russia, there's the Bolshevik Communist Revolution that is going to set up both World War II and the Cold War. Uh, in Germany, the Weimar Republic is going to overthrow the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm II, um, and is going to have a weak kind of situation where the Nazis are going to be able to take over that government. It's also the first time where we have a modern genocide um, in Armenia that the Ottoman Empire carries out. And this is foreshadowing eventually of what we see in the Second World War uh, with the Holocaust. And kind of in our story, the United States is finally going to be seen as a military power in which kind of the world is going to have to stand up and notice that America has become not only an industrial power, but a military one as well. And culturally, what this does is it takes a lot of those immigrant groups um, from the various parts of Europe, and they begin to become American because they fight together in mixed groups in these world wars. And so America goes out into the world and becomes what it becomes. Um, in the Middle East, the way that the maps are going to be drawn after the war by European powers in order to retain colonial control uh, is going to be a direct cause of wars in the Middle East, including the rise of the Islamic State um, and other terrorist groups. And so there's a direct link between the way this war ends and the wars that we're going to see for the rest of kind of uh, the next hundred years. Um, the Armenian Genocide um, is still a largely forgotten, uh, largely untold history, but it foreshadows everything that's going to come in World War II. In, the Soviet, in uh, Russia, a Bolshevik revolution spurred on by people being upset about World War I is going to create the Soviet Union. And Vladimir Lenin in the middle there and Joseph Stalin there to his left. And so it brings on all the history of that. And so Lenin promising peace, land, and bread has a communist revolution in the middle of World War I. But we need to go back to the beginning to understand how this all gets started. So this is a very simplistic telling of it. But in 1914, um, the world rivalries that we talked about with American imperialism, they're huge. Germany, Great Britain, France, Italy, the Ottomans, um, Austria-Hungarian Empire, they were all jockeying and fighting for control, influence over the world. Uh, sorry, I forgot to throw Russia in there too. Russia's in there. Um, and all of this is coming along with these economic and technological changes, right? Industry expands, um, communication, we now have film and pictures. And what this begins to do is it changes what is possible, both in warfare, but also within kind of your personal life. And so new classes of people arise. There's the working class, middle class. And so the societies themselves are changing. And some of these big changes come with urbanization, which creates, again, a lot of these new classes of people, and this rise of nationalism, the idea of like identifying very strongly with one's country and believing that one's country should have the most power in the world. 
And so, in, by 1914, also, too, imperialism had really taken root around the world. And within kind of these countries, going to be ruled by monarchs, there is a desire for more democracy. So there's a lot of people pushing for change. A lot of things are shifting. And the world in 1914 is caught between the world that was and the world that is going to be. And so the people who represent kind of this being trapped in tradition um, are the leaders of Europe. Um, you have Kaiser Wilhelm II in Germany. You have Emperor Franz Joseph, King George V, Tsar Nicholas II, Sultan Mehmet of the Ottoman Empire. And pretty much most of the countries um, in Europe, except for France at this time, are ruled by monarchs. But a lot of people begin asking, well, why? Why do we still have royals? How come I, my people, my group, can't have some power, some control over all these things? And so this is where I got to just say um, the Great War, World War I, it is a European war. Um, the causes are just between European powers, but what happens is it becomes a world war when those colonies get dragged in and then eventually those countries that try to stay neutral, like the United States, they eventually get dragged into this. But essentially this is a European war, though at the end of it it's hard to remember for a lot of people why it started in the first place. So really you can trace the uh, immediate origins of World War I to the creation of the German Empire. So Germany used to be just a bunch of states that really didn't work together very much. And until uh, in the 1870s, um, there are these wars of German unifications, where Germany kind of, where kind of one German ruler seeks to unite all these groups in order to become a very powerful country that could challenge everyone else. And their victory um, in the war with France, in the Franco-Prussian War, um, only spurs on and creates a bigger rivalry with France. Um, this also is, you know, um, there's fighting over the Alsace-Lorraine territory, which will become a lot more important in World War II. Um, but essentially, once Germany unifies under Kaiser Wilhelm I and his advisor Otto von Bismarck, who was really the person who um, had the idea for all of this, um, the United Germany immediately is probably the most powerful country in Europe. All these different groups finally getting together under one banner means that they're probably one of the number one industrial powers, military powers, and so this makes everyone else concerned. Because England, France were used to kind of being the big two. Now Germany is challenging them for that supremacy. And so if you want to look at the map of how big the German Empire used to be, uh, used to encompass a lot of territory it no longer has, but it's a big, but it's a big country and it has a lot of power within it. So the new Germany is built just on industry. And that industry is completely focused by Kaiser Wilhelm II on creating military power. Modern steel navy, huge pieces of artillery that could fire miles and miles away, um, airplanes, zeppelins, you name it. And so by 1900, um, kind of begrudgingly, most of the European powers have to admit that Germany is probably the most powerful country in Europe. And if you want to think about how powerful they are, um, they take on the rest of Europe plus the United States twice, and they almost win twice. And so that's saying something, very powerful nation. And so the conflicts that came along with that power um, were all about Germany wanting more. Germany wanted a larger empire. They did not feel they had enough colonies, but that conflicted with Britain and France's ambitions, right, to spread their thing around the world. Um, this also kicked off an arms race as like fear over Germany, possibly like pushing out into the world and becoming a larger empire. Um, people start to just stockpile weapons and invent new weapons. And so what this creates is instability where things are changing and the desire for change, both from people in these countries and these monarchies, as well as like, you know, Germany and some of these groups, um, they're just not gonna be able to be resolved peacefully. There's no way to resolve them outside of a big cataclysm that is gonna be the Great War. So the Europeans' arm race, um, it is very much linked to imperialism, right? It's linked to having the most powerful military so that you can conquer more of the world. And so this militaristic attitude um, really shows up in a lot of places with the building up of armies, the building up of technologies. And so what you start to see kind of are really modern armies emerging that are large standing armies. Um, you know, hundreds of artillery pieces, uh, millions of shells, really just kind of technology and industry is geared towards this building up of military power. And it's a pretty incredible thing to look at. And so that power comes out of the factory. And so civilians are going to take on greater and greater importance in, in this war than ever before. 
And so this arms race continues as all this new technology is going to be invented, new ways to fight. And so in response to the arms race, the fear that possibly all these new weapons of war might end up in a war, um, alliances are created to try to discourage anyone from declaring war on anybody else. And so you have kind of this rotating group of alliances throughout Europe that is supposed to prevent a world war from happening, when in fact it's going to actually do the opposite. And so militarism kind of becomes the flavor of the day. Military success during colonization means that people believe in all these countries that their nation will win, because why wouldn't they? Um, and so this kind of rising jingoism, uh, belief you know, the superiority of one's country, um, starts to push people towards war, right? Because if you're going to win the war, then you want to fight it, because it's going to be good for you because you're going to win it. There was also among like intellectuals and artists and teachers, the idea that like, oh, like we need to shake things up. Everything's stale. We need, you know, revolutions and new things. Um, and so the popular culture during this time, if you look at it before the war, it romanticizes war, that wars are for honor and glory and dying for one's country is the greatest thing that you can do. And so this generation of men and women who are going to be raised on these stories, uh, they're going to come to reject them. And that's going to be a very interesting thing to look at at the end of the war. So why does this break out in the first place? Um, it really breaks out in a lot of ways because of the problems of empire. The idea of like self-determination of peoples becomes a really big idea. The idea that like a group within an empire should have the right to their independence. However, the people who have those empires, uh, they're not going to really be wanting to give up control. And so this creates a lot of conflicts within these empires that are multi-ethnic or multi-religious. Um, Austrian-Hungarian Empire is a great example. They have a ton of different ethnic religious groups. Ottoman Empire is a great example of this. Um, and so within just the Austrian-Hungarian Empire alone, there are competing revolutionary groups um, that all hate each other. Serbs, Croats, Slovenes, Bosniaks. And they're not even working together on this, but they're all agitating for independence. Which brings us to Otto von Bismarck, who was a prophet because he said that with all this tension and all this, you know, everything building up, that it would be some damn fool thing in the Balkans that would throw the entire world into war. And he was absolutely right. Some damn fool thing in the Balkans threw the world into war. So these are the Balkans. Um, at this point, they are under the control um, of Austria-Hungary mostly. Uh, Serbia, Montenegro um, is like kind of independent at this point. But really, with, so within that country of Bosnia next to Serbia, there are a lot of different ethnic groups, and they all want independence. Um, and in fact, these ethnic groups, they really do not get along. Um, and in the 1990s, in the Yugoslav Wars, they actually fought a series of bloody, brutal civil wars um, during the mid-1990s. So you guys can look that up. Um, that's another consequence outgrowth of World War I. But uh, within the country of Bosnia, uh, which is controlled by the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, there's a group of Serbs, they're an ethnic group, that form this secret society called the Black Hand. It's backed by the Serbian military, they're a terrorist organization, and so they plot an assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. He is the, he is the heir to the throne of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. So if he is assassinated, that could spark a war. And that's exactly what the Black Hand wants. They think a war will destroy the Austrian-Hungarian Empire and will result in their independence. And this actually works. That's exactly what happens after the war. But this man, uh, Gavrilo Princip, uh, becomes one of the most famous people in world history because he is the man who pulls the trigger on June 28th of 1914 to assassinate the Archduke Franz Ferdinand in the town of Sarajevo in Bosnia. And so the Archduke goes on a tour of the city of Sarajevo, and along the way, several assassins are trying to get close enough, and it is Gavrilo Princip who gets the opportunity and shoots and kills the Archduke. He is immediately arrested, he's put on trial, he is hung, but the damage is done. And a giant crisis now, this assassination throws the world into chaos. The violence worsens in Bosnia. The Black Hand carries out other things, um, Austria-Hungary retaliates by, you know, hanging a bunch of people. So this violence is just getting worse and worse, and it's just devolving. Um, so Serbia, who are ethnically Serbs, are very close to the Russians, like ethnically. They ask Serbia for protection, like, oh, like, big brother, help us. And so uh, Russia basically said, okay, we'll protect you. 
Well, Austria-Hungary, upset over the assassination, sends an ultimatum to Serbia demanding all these things that Serbia was never going to do because the whole point is Austria-Hungary wants to go to war with Serbia, invade them, and punish them for what they have done. So Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia, Serbia declares war on Austria-Hungary, and this is where things get bad. At this point, the alliance system kicks in, and all of a sudden, everyone's declaring war on everyone. Russia declares war on Austria-Hungary. Well, Austria-Hungary has allies, and so they, Germany and Ottoman Empire, had to declare war on Russia. Then Russia has allies. Uh, their ally, you know, France has to declare war. Eventually, Britain has to declare war. And then once all these European countries go to war, well, then all their colonies that they control and govern, now they're all at war. So now you're drafting people from India, from Australia, from all over, from Africa, from all over the world. You're drafting people now into these armies. And so eventually, Japan, China, the United States, the world eventually gets into this. But it starts over something that maybe seems small. But that's kind of the argument that the world, as it's running towards war, no one is on the brakes to try to stop. And so just to remind ourselves, the alliances, on one side, we're going to have Great Britain, France, and Russia, eventually Italy, and eventually the United States. Central powers, over meow, we got Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. So those are the sides in 1914 when the war is going to be declared. And so the European war becomes a world war because of colonization. Canada, India, Australia, South Africa, Egypt, they all fight for Great Britain. And that is the essence of this colonialism during this time. So the world mobilizes for a war. They organize, they get ready for war, not knowing what kind of a war it would be. Young men are going to be recruited into the largest armies ever created, leaving behind, you know, their farm, their lives, their job, whatever else. And they expect glory. They expect honor. That's not what they are going to get. Um, young women are going to be mobilized and trained in ways that they had never before. They're going to be running industry, providing battlefield support, um, staffing hospitals, doing all sorts of things that, like, you know, even like 30 years before would be considered, you know, maybe impossible, you know. Um, and so what this means is total war. Everyone from the little kid to the, old, the oldest person is going to be involved in some way, shape, or form with the war effort. Everything. Every aspect is focused towards the military, and everyone's goal is to win the war. There's no one's life who is not touched by World War I. And so the world mobilizes. In Belgium, they come by bicycle. In France, you have Catholic priests blessing planes before they take their first flights. You have people who are going to work in record numbers. And so from 1914 to 1918, the world is at war. And so what results is a stalemate. Ultimately, because of technology, because of trench warfare, which we're going to learn about a little bit later, um, nothing is going to move on the Western Front. It is stalemate. There's going to be heavy casualties. Hundreds of thousands of people are going to die. And no progress is going to be made. The United States, as soon as this war gets underway, declares neutrality. And then slowly but surely, the war worsens, it deepens, and it spreads around the rest of the world. Bombing raids on civilian cities would become a part of life. In the Middle East, the Gallipoli campaign in Turkey ends up resulting in, um, you know, all sorts of stories and national identity. And so everything is happening. In the Atlantic Ocean, unrestricted submarine warfare is putting civilians at risk every day just by riding a boat to get from point A to point B. And this war is even going to have like multiple fronts in Europe, where there's a Western front in France, there's an Eastern front in Russia. And so ultimately what we look at here is the world hurdles towards war, but then once they're in it, they're going to find it impossible to win, but also impossible to get 